by skill. Um, and uh, this project was, was co-developed by Dr. Canella and myself. Um, we've heard discussion already about MRI as the safe modeling, and absolutely when we're looking at it with respect to ionizing uh, radiation, unquestionably, uh, MRI is the safer modality. But we need to recognize that there are specific and unique safety issues that confront MRI. Um, this is a look at adverse event reports to the FDA's MOD database. These are MRI accidents, and I'd like to take a look using the year 2000 as a baseline and looking strictly at the percentage change from uh, the year 2000. Uh, in the 10-year period between 2000 and 2009, the FDA records a 523% increase in the rates of MR accident reports. Um, contrast that with information from IMB, which is a market research firm that identifies just under 90% total procedure volume growth in that same time period. So we have a more than 5 to 1 increase in accidents for increase in patient volume. Um, if you'll notice in this graph, there is a substantial dip in the accident growth curve that occurs 2003, 2004. Um, I believe that this follows after the uh, 2001 death of Michael Colombini, the boy pictured on the screen, um, the death in which an oxygen cylinder was brought into the MRI exam room while the boy was in four. Uh, oxygen tank was drawn in, struck him in the head, killed him, uh, died of the injuries. The, coincidentally, that year there was uh, a special focus here at RSNA on MRI safety. It happened to be coincidentally planned in advance of that accident. In 2002, the ACR released what was then titled the White Paper on MR Safety. It's my belief that in the years following that accident that captured our attention and the specific prescriptive preventions that were identified in that original White Paper on MR Safety, the industry responded and enacted those safety protections, and we bent the accident growth curve even in 2004 below the organic growth curve for procedure volume. However, from 2005 onward, we have not done such a good job. This, despite the fact that there have been two additional publications in the ACR document, subsequently retitled the Guidance Document for Safe Outdoor Practices, and in 2008, the Joint Commission Sentinel Event Alert, their highest patient safety warning, Sentinel Event Alert number 38, which dealt specifically with MRI accidents and injuries. Um, one of the gross problems with FDA accident report data, acknowledged by the FDA among others, is that the data submitted is highly underrepresentative of what actually occurs in the industry. Um, we sought to uh, come up with a more effective analysis of the uh, total number of accidents by correlating a single year for which we had FDA data and we had data from the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. In that year, these two databases are non-correlated between the two of them. Reporting to uh, Pennsylvania does not necessarily mean you're reporting to the FDA as well. Um, in fact, in that year, 2008, the state of Pennsylvania reported 90% of the total number of MRI adverse events that were in the federal database. This either means that Pennsylvania is far and away the most unsafe state in which to get an MRI, or more likely that there is profound underrepresentation of MRI accidents. So we sought to utilize the Pennsylvania data and uh, model that out to a national level. Pennsylvania has 4% of the U.S. population. Multiply times 25 to population correct. Pennsylvania reporting only requires reporting to hospitals. Um, in the U.S., almost exactly 50% of MR imaging is done at outpatient imaging center. So we take our number multiplied times 25 for population correction, and we actually double it again to get provider correction, and we wind up with a number of 7,400 estimated MR adverse events in the United States in the year 2008, one year alone. So we look at the trend from 2005 onward, and we see remarkable, alarming growth in MR accidents, and we ask ourselves, how can this be, despite all of these publications? The, the existence of the best practice standards does not equate to improved performance because the existing best practice standards exist only as recommendations. Not a single regulatory accreditation or state licensure board requires the use of existing safety best practices, such as the ACR guidance document. What do we need to actually protect MR patients? We need objective 
measurable, true, false, yes, no, pass, fail, do they have it, do they not, protections for MR patients at the point of care setting. Um, Dr. Canal and I actually went back and we looked at, at the time, the most contemporary two years of FDA adverse events, MRI adverse event reports. We looked at injury accidents uh, for those two years, 2009 and 2010. In those that had a narrative that we could compare against the pre preventions identified in both the ACR guidance document and the Joint Commission Sentinel Event Alert, we tested the contributing effects of each one of those events against the preventions in those two documents. The ACR guidance document would have inhibited 84% of those injury accidents in that two-year period. The Joint Commission Sentinel Event Alert 38 slightly less effective in inhibiting 64% of the adverse events resulting in injury in those two years. Um, this analysis brought us to look at the three most frequent sources of injury and in MR. Um, they are burns. These three preventions right here would eliminate 97% of the burn events reported to the FDA. One centimeter of air gap or padding, uh, removing unneeded electrically conducted material or insulating those that remained, preventing large caliber body loops. These three preventions, also from the ACR guidance document, would have prevented 94% of the projectile accidents. Implementing the ACR4 zone model that links access to screening and supervision, utilizing ferromagnetic detection systems, and labeling objects that reside within the MRI suite to identify what their safety profile is for MR. Thirdly, the first one of these is from the ACR guidance document, and unfortunately, it would have mitigated only 29% of the reported hearing injuries. Um, so we added the subsequent two because we felt as though uh, this would dramatically improve the, the performance in terms of protections for patient safety. In conclusion, uh, we have identified the vectors for the most common and most severe sources of MR injury. We have demonstrated the effectiveness of existing best practices. So why if we know how injuries occur and how to prevent them, are they still occurring? As recommendations, the existing best practices um, have been unsuccessful. We have done an inadequate job of self-policing. Perhaps it's time to proceed with something beyond recommendations and consider accepting mandatory minimal MR safe practices, and this is for the sake of patients as well as providers.